Welcome to Babel, Translating the Middle East, a podcast from the Middle East program at CSIS. Here on Babel, we take you beyond the headlines to take a closer look at what's happening in the Middle East and why it matters. This week on Babel, I speak with Badr Saif, a U.S.-trained Kuwaiti academic. We discuss Kuwaiti's perceptions of the Israel-Hamas war, U.S. geostrategy, and where Kuwait itself is headed almost 35 years after Iraq's invasion of the country. Then I continue the conversation with my colleagues Will Todman and Leah Hicker. To translate some of what's happening in the Middle East, this is Babel. Badr Saif is Assistant Professor of History at Kuwait University, a consultant and a non-resident fellow at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Badr, welcome to Babel. Thank you, John. Pleasure to be with you. So what is the mood in the Middle East these days? And are you surprised at the mood in the Middle East these days? I'm glad that we're starting with the mood because it's on everyone's minds. It translates to everyone's actions. And let me tell you, I've been to all Gulf capitals plus Iraq since after the war on Palestine unleashed in October. And I haven't seen such anti-Americanism in a very, very long time. And even ever, we haven't had such levels of anger, really anger. And it's not only popular anger that manifests in weekly protests, boycotts, angry memes, social media, and coordinated action, but you also see it on the official level, which has been quite interesting. I mean, I haven't seen the Omani foreign establishment be this expressive, be this angry. I mean, I haven't seen them go out and condemn in such clear language. I haven't seen the Qataris increase their dose of statements and the feeling of being underappreciated with their mediation efforts. Another example which has caught my attention is the UAE. And I'm thinking here their presence in the UN in 2023 and the amount of successive statements that have only grown more concerned with U.S. inaction, with Israeli action, and with the lack of support that the issue should get. And you've talked about this as, in some cases, Arab publics leading their governments. And for the most part, foreign policy issues have been issues that have been considered sovereignty issues that publics have deferred to their governments about. Certainly in the UAE, normalization wasn't popular before it happened. But once it did happen, the Emirati public largely deferred to the government. Why is this different? Palestine is an issue that's central to many, many generations. And the manifestations of that interest in Palestine come in different ways. And they may not be ways that can be polled. They might not be ways that can be put out very publicly, but they are ingrained not only in the Arab Gulf states, but across the larger Middle East, including non-Arab countries like Iran and Turkey, for example. And this comes up the clearest when there is naturally an attack. Now, Leaderships in the region do not like for Palestine to spiral out for various reasons. A, this is a cause that shouldn't be living on as long as it has. We're talking about 75 years of agony, many years of occupation, displacement, and injustice, really, in various forms. But this also translates into domestic issues within each country. You have, on the one hand, leaders across generations using this cause to advance their own interests. I'm thinking the Egypt of Jamal Abdel Nasser moving down. I'm thinking if we jump to 2023-24, the Houthis in Yemen using this to advance their own personal interests. So it becomes really messy and confused. And it confuses a lot of the public in the process. And this is not healthy for the development of those countries. Many of these countries are looking for the prosperity of their people. They want to move into the future. Yet this issue keeps pulling them back. So this issue really needs a just and lasting resolution that takes on all parties. It's really complex, it's multi-layered. So for this cause to continue unchecked, unchanged, doesn't bode well for anyone. But there was a sense, and I certainly got it when I talked to leaders in the Gulf, when I talked to leaders in the Levant, that the younger generation didn't have the same connection to Palestine that the older generation done, that people had become 
desensitized. They were interested in entertainment and music and jobs and all kinds of other things. And that Palestine was the failed cause of an earlier generation. I was a little bit surprised because this is a generation that grew up watching images on Jazeera, that grew up with social media, that this was a generation that had exposure to Palestine. But people told me, no, 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 Palestine, we're moving on. That's sort of retro and doesn't have salience. But after the Atli hospital bombing a few days into this conflict, which ironically seems not to have been carried out by Israel, but we saw it come back to young generations with vigor, I think almost shockingly stronger. Were you at all surprised or did you never buy into the narrative? I wasn't surprised. And I think I'm on the record saying that this has been something that didn't dissipate. And I say this, John, because I teach in Kuwait University and I see students in and out, both Kuwaiti and Arab, and I see these discussions come forward. Let me give you an example. I teach a class called Contemporary Arab Affairs. And in the class, I try to do a simulation to have a person be in someone else's shoe so that we can move on and resolve a conflict. And guess which conflict I chose? The, I chose the, the Palestine-Israel conflict. And I had certain students take on the role of Israel. A, I had to sit down and convince them that this is a simulation. You're not going to be castigated or looked down at for being Israel. So that was one. And then second, you should see the amount of... I had to stop it. I mean, the amount of attack that came from the other Arab states in the simulation, plus Kuwait, is quite indicative of popular mood among the youngsters. And I say this not only in Kuwait, but I see this in the other states that do have openness to protests. We saw this in Bahrain. Bahrain has been protesting, gosh, for the last 17 or 18 weeks now, consistently. And Bahrain has normalized too, so that's one clear example there. And I've seen this in Qatar, I've seen this in Oman. For others, you see this across social media, you see this in discussion forums. So it comes with different ways. I don't think it has died out. Do you think this conflict changes in a durable way Gulf states' perceptions of the U.S. as a reliable partner? I would put this conflict as part of a larger semblance of various acts that have been taking place in the region and in the world. I mean, the U.S. is not the U.S. that we've known. There has been a concerted effort for it to pivot away from the Middle East. And we've seen this in successive administrations, regardless of party, starting with Obama. So it's not only because of what's happening with Israel and Palestine alone, although that's very central and key, but I think the way that they've been positioning themselves in the region, how reliable can they be? Look, they're not going anywhere, regardless of what they try to say. They're there, the numbers speak for themselves, the bases are there, and I think they keep getting pulled in. What matters to the U.S. is if they try to bring in a grand strategy that looks at the Gulf within world politics, as opposed to looking at the Middle East and the Gulf on its own. I think that's the issue, and that's the issue that they need to move beyond. Because look, they've been trying to take the battle to China or to compete with the Far East, but the Far East is in the Middle East anyway. So try to bring those blocks together. The Gulf has taken the cue. They've been trying to diversify. This is not new in their long history. The U.S. has been a phase in a very long history of various superpowers that have shown. And this will be a very interesting game to watch, to see how things fit differently. But I don't think any of the current steps taking place are displacing the number one place for the U.S. And that will continue for some time. You know, from a U.S. perspective, partnership with the Middle East has been difficult. There's been a lot of complaints that the Middle East has not been supportive of the U.S. view of Ukraine, despite the fact that the U.S. view is that the same sanctity of international borders is what brought the United States to defend Kuwait in 1990. And when I was in Kuwait a little more than a year ago and, and talked about the dissonance for American audiences between defending the Kuwaiti border and defending the Ukrainian border, folks in a Kuwaiti audience said to me, well, Ukraine's really far from Kuwait. And I looked and said, but Kuwait is really far from the United States. There seems to be a real dissonance between the Gulf's sense of cooperation with the United States on security issues and the Gulf's willingness to support the United States outside the Gulf on security issues. 
It's more of a mixed reaction, really, in the Gulf. And I don't want to paint a holistic image for all states. I'm glad that you started with Kuwait because from a foreign policy perspective, they've come up very clearly, very early on, condemning the attack, and they've been the least to engage with the Russian side, from my own observation, among the Gulf states. And the Kuwaitis came out very forcefully, in their opinion. So did Qatar. So trying to nuance how things move forward, for the others, they see themselves as larger fish in the pond, and they have other global interests that demand them to take a middle position for the sake of mediating the conflict. I think that's how they presented themselves. Some circles in American policymaking circles have bought into it and others have not. And it's all connected because with the whole Russia situation, you have an energy issue there. And I think that's the same concern that some of those Gulf states had when it comes to Russia in terms of how much can you pressure in ways that doesn't disrupt the OPEC plus, in ways that doesn't disrupt the energy security in place. What do you see the future U.S. role in the Middle East being? I mean, given tension over global perspectives, given disappointment in the region with the U.S. view, given the possibility that we could end up with a very different U.S. position on Palestine, either through success or failure over the next several years, if you had a crystal ball and we're looking forward 10 years, what do you think the U.S. role in in the Middle East in general is going to be and what the U.S. role in the Gulf is going to be? Don't we wish we all had these crystal balls, right? Let me flip the question. I think it should start from the region because it's the regional perspective that should matter the most, and that's what the Americans should listen to, to guide their own policymaking. I think the region needs to believe further in itself. And I think that's what the region has been doing, by the way. For the past few years, we've seen a few hints here and there. And that self-realization, ironically, is what the Americans have been calling for for the longest time. We can't take on the tab forever. You need to take care of your own security. You need to share the neighborhood. Remember that talk from Obama? So all of this is really coming to fruition. I think we are at very exciting times in which there will be more of an organic solution or an organic method to resolving conflicts. Don't forget the UAE and Saudi are very keen on developing their local defense capabilities. And we've seen a lot of steps in that direction. We've seen also an interest in developing peaceful nuclear energy. So more and more, we're seeing some of those Gulf states taking matters in their own hands. I think that's a healthy development. And that should guide not only relations with the U.S., but with any other superpower. You've talked at some length about the rising Saudi role in regional diplomacy, partly guided by a Saudi sense of strategic patience. How does that play out as we think about the next decade? Saudi Arabia's foreign policy has been very stable if you subtract the first few years of the King Salman era. But I think since 2021, they've been going back to their original demeanor, and that includes strategic patience. And there is some merit to that strategic patience because as a rising power, not only in the region, but I mean, they're among the G20 nations at the moment. They feel that they have a responsibility to the world, both on the economic side, when it comes to maintaining the energy supply, but also as the spiritual head of Islam with housing Mecca and Medina. So you need to be calculating, you need to take risk very carefully, and you need to work behind closed doors. And that's what they've been doing, really. They've been sending a lot of messages. They work very hard. And I know you know that as well, because we go to Riyadh all the time and we talk to many of those officials. It doesn't look as it seems in the public. They may seem to some as reactive, lethargic, slow, but there is a lot of action behind all of this. And that action is certainly coordinated across the Gulf states. So the centrality of Saudi Arabia should not be lost on observers of the region. And they tend to be underestimated, but they shouldn't be. I think that's where things should be gravitating towards, and they are moving forward. You know, in the 1960s and 70s, Kuwait was in many ways the engine of the region, socially, economically, in a whole number of ways, politically. And it's not. You've written an article in Majella about the stagnation in Kuwait that's prevailed. At other times, it's achieved remarkable growth. Kuwait now has 
a new emir. It has a new prime minister. What does it take for Kuwait to succeed? And how do you move the system in the direction you think Kuwait wants to, needs to move? Let me first start with something at the risk of sounding like a broken record, but this picture is the image of Kuwait in general. Kuwait, regardless of all the problems that it's going through, it goes unnoticed, underestimated as well, and underappreciated across the international arena when it comes to looking at the Middle East. And this is unfortunate because it's the only effective Arab constitutional monarchy. You don't get as much leeway to hit hard on everyone but the emir, except in Kuwait. And let me tell you, it's a system with a lot of flaws. We have gone through a trauma. I argued in that piece that you mentioned from Al-Majalla that we haven't gone through closure yet. Many are still you know, waiting for their remnants of their relatives to come back. And there hasn't been a national strategy to close the chapter. So that needs to be done. And I think what needs to be done as well is understand that those growing pains of the system should not stall development. We've had a parliament since the 60s. We're on our fourth constitution, John. We've had one in 1921, 38, 39, and this one came in 62. And I think time is ripe for a fifth, really. Renewing the social contract is something that we can do. And it come in various forms. I mean, you guys in the US have had amendments to the constitution. Other places have changed their constitutions altogether. I think we can do well with looking back at our 60 plus years of this constitutional era. What went wrong? What went right? How can we develop the system further? But I think, again, it's not being fixated on the system as much as the practices. How do you envision the country moving forward? There is a heated debate, as always in Kuwait, on how to move the country forward. And I think there needs to be some form of coalescing. And that's why I've been calling for an actual national dialogue. You know, we haven't had a real national dialogue since the occupation. And I'm reminding you and the listeners to the Jeddah conference that we had in October 1990 under occupation, when all Kuwaitis from all types came in to renew their pledge to al-Sabah and to the constitutional democracy that they've put together. But I think the time is really ripe to move on with this. And we have a new set, a new crew, as you mentioned, right now in Kuwait. We're starting the year off, new government, new emir. But it's not the choice of minister per se that makes or breaks the system. It's bigger than that. How do those ministers work together? What kind of process? What kind of vision do you have for the country? And can we allow that vision to then rule supreme instead of having it go through a lot of debating. But there's also the problem in Kuwait that I think you have in the United States, that part of the role of the government that people care about is distributing government resources. So in the United States, you have this entitlement state that takes up more than half of the federal budget for welfare, for Social Security, for Medicare, for those kinds of things, which people are entitled for. And they see that as a role of the state. In Kuwait, where the state has remarkable oil wealth, people have taken the role of the state to be to distribute the state's oil wealth in exchange for loyalty. And the idea that the people would have to be productive seems to be marginalized. And in states without a parliamentary democracy, the ruler says, these are going to be the rules. This is going to have to be how it is. And in Kuwait, the parliament says, let's talk about forgiving everybody's debt. Part of the problem of democracy when there are central resources is that people say the role of the government is to give the resources to me and people like me. And in Kuwait, to my tribe. And rather than building resources and building a productive society, you have the state playing the role allocating resources to citizens. And look, you know, this is a historical. This is not a reflection of Kuwait's history, by the way. This is only when the oil pumping started in the late 40s and the money rushed in in the 50s, and that's the beginnings of the welfare state. But if you look at Kuwait's very long history, and I say this to my students the whole time, look, we have a 300 plus year history. The exception is the oil era. The norm is being in a healthy society that provides to the government there were a lot of taxes prior to oil, and people contributed to the well-being of society, and they were responsible. 
And when push comes to shove, John, they did act in that manner during the occupation. We had Kuwaitis piling up the garbage, cleaning up the streets, distributing food, baking. So it takes social re-engineering. And I think the way that this current government started with the message, he said, my project is to develop the new economic identity of Kuwait. And I think that's very important because you need to change perceptions. And that is not only about switching from one welfare system to another, but it's about changing mindsets. It's about reclaiming Kuwaitiness, the Kuwaitiness of sacrifice, those people that perished in sea or in desert trying to make ways for their own people. That needs to move forward. And only by doing that will you break the addictive cyclicality of the political system and the cyclicality of having, as you said, people push for more welfare, the government being not as strong enough to stop that interaction. And then you end up either with the resignation of the government or a dissolution of parliament. And fast forward, you repeat again and again. And we've been doing this for some time. Kuwait has been developing in a different direction in the last two to three years. I've written about this in another piece with the Arab Gulf States Institute. I call it Kuwait's new doctrine. And I think in that new doctrine, the emir, then the crown prince at the time, was trying consciously to break that cycle. But everyone needs to agree that we need to move forward. And that's where the national dialogue, John, comes in handy. We need to agree on the next steps. We're not going to please everyone. It will be filled with a lot of debates. Again, there will be some sacrifices that need to be done. But we need to keep an eye on the Kuwait, not only of today, but the Kuwait of tomorrow. So let me ask a difficult question. Obviously, this takes a lot of things. It takes political leadership. It takes charisma. It takes maybe changing some of the rules, maybe some constitutional pieces. What's the most important element? I mean, obviously, there are infinite numbers of elements. But is this a question of you really need a charismatic leader or you need a stronger leader or you need to get consensus on a different set of rules that will create a different set of outcomes. What do you need to prioritize to get to the point that you're talking about? Shifting the mindset, John, and that takes a lot of messaging, cultural shifts, ingraining the history of their own grandpas and grandmoms that sacrificed the country. And I spoke about masked unemployment. That's what I called it, al-bitala al muqanna'a because look, I mean, we have very low unemployment rates in Kuwait and arguably in the Gulf even. But if you dig deep, as you know, many of them are just being paid for showing up and fingerprinting at the beginning. You show up the, once. You show once or maybe twice if you end up going for coffee or running errands and you need to exit when you leave as well. And let's not fool ourselves. That's a recipe for disaster. We've been doing that for decades and it might be a misconstrued form of understanding that there is a right to work. Some people think that this means that immediate employment by government, but it doesn't, it doesn't. Change the mindset, try to stop that crazy employment. Tell them that I'm gonna fund you. I'll still redistribute wealth, but I'll do it in a clever way. I'll have certain small and medium businesses pursued. I'll give you a fraction of the oil wealth if the prices are in a good shape. If they're not, you're not getting anything. There are many ways to still endow people, but to have them maintain their own sanity by being functional citizens, which many of them are not. The region now looks very dark. When do you think we can start expecting some better news? And how good do you think things will get? Or do you think we're going to be on this cyclical up and down in the Middle East for many years to come? It's a matter of perception, John. And you know, I ask myself this question every day. And the way I look at it is, Let's take care of the bad as we celebrate the good at the same time, because there are some good stories out there. If you look at the amount of talent, the amount of innovation that some of the youth are doing in the region, it's something to keep an eye on. If you look at some of the achievements, I mean, look at Oman, for example, the way that the economy has turned around and they've shown a surplus and now they're building their own local sovereign wealth fund. That's a story that doesn't get told as much. Iraq is not in its best of cases, but you know what? If you look at Iraq since 1920, this past 20 years is probably, I mean, they've never had four-year prime ministers and governments in their very long history. 
So let's not be too harsh on ourselves. Yes, there is a lot of blood and it's very dark and we do not deserve this. No one deserves this. Everyone needs to live in peace. Everyone needs to feel safe. Everyone needs to have a sense of dignity flying through. We shouldn't be arguing for basics. But we also need to think of how to move the country forward. And I think the young ones might do a better job than many of us have in trying to bring the sanity that the Middle East urgently needs. Madhur Asaif, thank you very much for joining us on Babel. Thank you, John. In your discussion, Badr discussed how some leaders and groups like Nasser in Egypt or the Houthis in Yemen use the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to serve their own domestic agendas. What other ways have you seen governments in the region use the conflict for their own benefit? Sometimes it's been a distraction. And when there's no good news, people talk about all the international news, the need for solidarity. There's also been a way in which People have been allowed to organize around Palestine as the only issue people are allowed to organize around. This has been an issue that people have talked about. It's been salient to people for a long time, and it remains salient to a whole bunch of people. I think in the early days after independence and after the creation of the State of Israel, several governments used it really to, to sort of furnish their legitimacy, both moral and in some cases religious as well. You know, this was the time of pan-Arabism, anti-colonialism, and I think it fit quite well into consolidating the rules of some of these states. There are then some states who've had economic benefits from it as well, not in support of the Palestinian cause, but by normalizing with Israel and forging peace with Israel. Most dramatically, I think the case with Egypt in 1979, since that point, Egypt has benefited hugely economically from having and maintaining peace with Israel. So it's sort of served quite different benefits there. And I think, you know, then the government has tried to control the bounds of advancing the, the Palestinian cause among Egyptian people. Right. Of course, the Egyptian people have never been very enthusiastic about normalization. That's always been something that was more government led. And I think, you know, there's also a way in which Palestine became a prism through which a lot of people in the region, governments and populations alike, saw here's a, a manifestation of the region being at the short end of the stick, the region's weakness, being the reason the rest of the world solves its problems on the back of the region. They say Israel was created to solve the problem Europeans created with the Holocaust. And it was only because the region was weak that the region couldn't resist it. There is a way that the region thinks a lot. Arab states think a lot about their sense of relative weakness, the sense of injustice in the international system. And Palestine both articulates that sense of injustice, that sense of weakness, and exacerbates that sense of injustice, that sense of weakness. And I've seen it from generation to generation in the Arab world. And not just Arab states as well, but like look at Iran and how Iran uses the Palestinian cause. Even the you know, part of the IRGC that engages abroad in the Middle East is the Quds Force, named after Jerusalem. This is really central to Iranian rhetoric about its interventions in the region. And in Pakistan, and in Malaysia, and in Indonesia. I mean, this is a, a broader issue. And it really, it's not a surprise that, that the global South is interested in Palestine, because Palestine is seen as a an example of how Western problems are solved on the backs of the global south, rather than the West dealing appropriately with the problems it creates by itself. Everyone acknowledges that this is an issue that really has persisted throughout the decades. But how have governments' approaches to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict changed in recent years, and how have their populations reacted? I think we'll captured it. You know, there has been this move to normalization among many states, and in many cases, populations have accommodated themselves to government efforts at normalization. I was frankly surprised that there wasn't more hostility in the Emirates to the Abraham Accords. What I had heard from people was it's probably about a third, a third, a third, a third of people support it because they want to support the government, a third of the people oppose it because they have just very deep feelings. About a third of the people are kind of neutral and say, well, I don't know, we'll see how it plays out. 
I think some of that has changed since October 7th. But there certainly wasn't a, an uprising against it. There wasn't an uprising in Egypt, but there wasn't an embrace of it. And frankly, when I've been in the Emirates, I've seen much more visible presence of Israelis more quickly than I thought I would see, because the population really wasn't hostile to it. Now, you can say that's because it's an authoritarian government that has made its decision and the people go along. You could say that the issue isn't salient as much as it used to be, and I think that's a little bit open for debate. But, you know, as you look forward to other states, you look forward to places like Saudi Arabia and what's the possibility of normalization with Saudi Arabia. I think when you look at, at people's general deference to the government, that's a factor. But then you also look at the fact that after this Gaza war has broken out, we've seen populations in some ways leading governments and governments being much more concerned about the domestic response than they might have been. So it feels like there's there's more of an interplay. I think the advantage is still with the governments, but there's a delicate back and forth and the governments are always paying attention to that delicate back and forth. And one of the ways that I think this has played out is not in terms of full normalization or rejection of normalization, but in more intermediate steps that governments have taken, which looks like it is testing the boundaries of how far they can take people. If you look at Saudi Arabia, then, you know, there are Israeli athletes now competing in Saudi Arabia. There are some Israeli ministers have visited Saudi Arabia, now admittedly under the auspices of UN organized events and international events, but still that's an important step, I think. And then more states opening up their airspace to Israeli aircraft as well. So I think the bounds of the conversation have certainly shifted in quite a big way, but has Badar said, you know, I was in Oman in December and I was doing a research for a completely unrelated project to Israel or Palestine. And Gaza came up in almost every single conversation I had. McDonald's were totally empty. Starbucks were totally empty. There was this real social solidarity in support of the Palestinian people. I even went to the Opera House and they said, we've canceled all performances in solidarity with Palestine. So there are all these ways in which populations are showing their I think, horror at what's happening in Gaza. And it's a difficult time, I think, for governments to try to work out exactly where the boundaries of acceptability are when it comes to relations with Israel. Considering this type of social solidarity, and John, I think you touched upon this already, do you think democracy is the reason why the Kuwaiti government is so hostile to normalization with Israel, whereas the Emirati government embraces it? I think as part of that, there's a deeper history of Kuwait and the Palestinians. And there used to be a large Palestinian community in Kuwait. A lot of them were pushed out after Saddam Hussein invaded. And there was a sense that, you know, in 1990, the Palestinians were on the side of Saddam Hussein. So there was, in some ways, a love of the Palestinian cause, but individual Palestinians suffered and had to leave countries where they had, had built their careers. So I think Kuwait has a, a more complicated history, but certainly one of the issues that I've heard a lot about in Kuwait is people who said, well, what would happen in parliament? Parliament would go ballistic. And that's certainly a factor. Is it an overwhelming factor? I don't know that it's an overwhelming factor, but it's certainly an important one. In the Emirates, you have a government that is very good at messaging very concerned about messaging and was very conscientious about messaging. And you also have a government that, quite frankly, has earned the trust of its people over time. One of my Emirati friends says, you have to understand the reservoir of goodwill that people in the Emirates have toward the government, because look at how much has happened, how much economic and social and political progress the Emirates has had at a time of relatively broad social peace. I think there, there's a sense that genuinely, while the Emirates is an authoritarian government, it's an authoritarian government that I believe genuinely has the support of the overwhelming portion of its population. Kuwait has never, as better said, it's, it's never quite recovered its mojo since 1990. There's always a sense of fear. There's a sense of stagnation. There's a sense that the parliament is trying to soak the rich guys and give things back to the population. There's a way in which the way Kuwaiti society has evolved, especially since 1990, 
that the government really doesn't have that reservoir of goodwill. One of the interesting questions is, can they recover what will be necessary to recover? He talked about a constitutional amendment. I've known the current prime minister, Dr. Mohammed, from when he was ambassador to Washington. Very thoughtful guy, not just because he has a Harvard PhD in economics, which is one of the hard PhDs to get at Harvard. He's a very smart guy, but he's shrewd. He's thoughtful. I think he's politically savvy. He was there because the public said, well, here's a guy who has integrity. So let's put him in control. Let's, let's you know, have some integrity in government. Can you create that moment and galvanize something? Interesting. It's an interesting challenge. I think for the Kuwaitis, the challenge is, can you make a government using democratic instruments that has the kind of broad social support that the UAE government has? That's not impossible, but it's hard. And I think that's the task ahead of it. And that's a task that, frankly, Badr is, is engaged in pursuing. I would highlight one other factor, which I think is linked to democracy, which is Islamism. And I think the UAE and Kuwait both have really different relations with Islamism and the relationship between Islamism and the Palestinian cause. So after Hamas took over Gaza in 2006, I think that really alarmed states like the UAE, which has taken a really hard stance against political Islam and I think views it as a threat. Whereas in Kuwait, Islamists are a big part of the political system. They're a big part of parliament. And I think there is naturally more of a accommodation for Islamism in Kuwait. And so I think that also reshapes the boundaries of what's possible from a Kuwaiti system and what's possible or what's desirable from the UAE system as well. It's an excellent point. And of course, a lot of the UAE's hostility to political Islam came out of 9-11, and it's been developing over time, and Kuwait just had a different experience of that, partly because Kuwait didn't have 9-11 hijackers. That's very interesting. Thank you for joining me, John. Thank you for joining me, Will. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Leah. Thank Thanks for listening to Babel. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find more analysis on this topic linked in the show notes on the CSS website, and you can find us on Twitter at CSIS Mideast.